Good morning, Sabino Road, and those joining us online. Pastor John here. I want to let you know about a new sermon series I'll be beginning called Joy in Hard Places. This will be a study through the book of Philippians. You know, when you look back over this past year, it seems like there's not a lot to be joyful about. When you talk to a lot of people, they seem discouraged and downcast. But thankfully for the child of God, our joy is not based on circumstances, good or bad. Our joy is based on the unchanging character of Christ. So now more than ever, our world needs to see the joy that we have in us. Uh, so please join us uh, for this new sermon series. Also, I want to let you know that things are finally starting to get back to normal here at Sabino Road. Most of our ministries are back in full force, and we've had many guests attending over the last several weeks, as well as having several of our church members be able to return to services. God is still working through Sabino Road. We've had several people join over the last couple of weeks, and hopefully we'll have some people baptized here soon. So we are thankful for God working in our midst. Finally, I want to let you know, church, that myself and the staff that we are praying for you and that we want to be helpful for you in any way that we can so god bless you stay faithful keep fighting the good fight and we'll see you soon well good morning church it's good to see you all here every sunday we're getting more and more people what a wonderful thing that is Let's stand and let's worship our great King, our great God, and lift our voices in praise to Him.
for your grace and mercy, Lord. It's amazing grace. Sing this. You've extended a mercy to
Amen Church and good morning. Please turn with me in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. We're beginning a new series through the book of Philippians called Joy in Hard Places. I trust, I pray, I hope that the last series about dealing with doubt has been helpful for you. And if you've missed any of those sermon, uh, sermons, I encourage you to go and watch them online. But we're continuing, uh, or we're beginning a new series for the book of Philippians called Joy in Hard Places. The title of today's message is Joy in Community. You know, over, uh, maybe you don't see it in sitcoms as much nowadays, but they used to have these things called laugh tracks that were played all the time. <laughs> yeah, I like that. So now the people on watching on video online are like, man, that pastor's really killing it today. But, uh, and so just have that queued up for the rest of the sermon. So whenever I tell something I think is funny, I'll just be like, hit it. And, uh, <laughs> and so I don't know why they don't, they don't play those anymore as much. And maybe there's some reasons before that. behind that. I don't watch a lot of TV. But I always thought it was sort of interesting to have this empty laughter. They're not real people laughing at the jokes that is uh, a laugh track that is played that tells people hey this is when you're supposed to be joyful this is when you're supposed to be happy this is when you're supposed to laugh and I always thought that was sort of silly and fake and phony and it really is in a lot of ways Uh, when you look around our world there's a lot of fake joy there's a lot of superficial artificial laughter and joy and people smile and they laugh And they look for joy in these different places, but then on the inside, they are miserable. In a world of downers and disappointments, setbacks, failures, tragedy, disaster, it is easy to get downcast. When I look back on 2020, it's easy to get a little down sometimes, right? It's easy to, or it's hard to find joy. But there is joy for the believer. You see, happiness is based on happenings. And so depending on the happening, my happiness can go up or my happiness can go down. Man, when I hit that green light, boy, my happiness can it goes right back up. And if I miss that green light, my happiness can go back down. It's that fickle, right? I'll, uh, when you go to Dairy Queen and, man, you get one of their blizzards, well, that'll, that'll make you happy right there. And then they do that thing where they turn it upside down. You all ever seen that there at Dairy Queen? Okay. Well, that just brings happiness to my heart, man, every time. Happiness is fickle. It comes. It goes. And that's okay. That is the way happiness works. But true happiness is a byproduct of joy. A very good quarterback, I won't call him the greatest of all time, Tom Brady, um, is a, a good quarterback. And uh, went after winning his third Super Bowl, in a real sort of candid moment in his interview, he said, is this really all there is? Is this what life is all about? Now, many times these guys kind of walk back these statements later on, but he's feeling what a lot of people in this world feel. Hey, I've got the relationships, I've got the job, I've got the career. Surely this should be, I should be filled with joy and happiness, and I am not. But Christians are all for joy. We just have a different source for it. The world looks for joy and happiness and sex and power and entertainment. But as believers, we know that joy is an attitude of the heart determined by confidence in Christ Jesus. Let me say that again to make sure everybody's listening. Joy is an attitude of the heart determined by confidence in Christ Jesus. Friends, if you are only happy, you're only joyful when things are going well for you, then you're not going to have a lot of joy and happiness in your life. Because, man, life will throw a lot of things at you. And uh, maybe you'll be happy. Maybe circumstances will be nice for a while. But, man, they, they go up and down. They ebb and flow. And if your joy is based on circumstances, you're not going to be happy. You're not going to be joyful very often. But for the believer, for the follower of Christ, for the child of God, our joy is not based 
based on our circumstances. It is based on the unchanging character of Jesus Christ. And so we can sing with joy, thank you, Lord, for what you've done in our life, regardless of what our situation is, regardless if we've been sick or we're going to be sick, regardless of what our joy or what our job situation is, regardless of what any of those things are, our joy is unchanging because it is based on Jesus Christ, who does not change. The Philippians, you can't do this with most books of the Bible, but you can with the book of Philippians. It is summed up with one word, joy. If you read the several chapters of Philippians, Paul uses the word joy and joyful and rejoice repeatedly in this book. The essence of the book of Philippians is joy. You know, joy is the greatest advertisement that believers have. And when a lost world is looking at a, a, a heart or circumstances that we've gone through and saying that person has every right to be bitter, that person has every right to be anger or upset or depressed, and there are moments of that for believers, absolutely. But we can say with absolute conviction that we have joy. And that's an advertisement to a lost world that something's different about their joy. Because their joy, the lost world's joy, is based on circumstances and things going the right way. The believer's joy is based on Christ. So one way we experience joy in the Christian life is through community. The community of faith. We all are part of a community of faith. Now, as believers in Christ, we're all part of the body of Christ, and that community spans all throughout church history, all throughout the globe, and, and, and extends to all the globe today. But you need to be part of a, of a specific community where you can have relationships with other believers. So today we're going to look at how we can find joy in Christ and his community. So read along with me in Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. The Apostle Paul writes, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the overseers and deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God and all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all are making my prayer with, will you say it with me, church? Joy. And that's not the last time he'll say that in this letter. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and the defense of the confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Um, so let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to be gathered together as brothers and sisters in Christ in a community of faith under the blood of Christ Jesus. Lord, I thank you that you have given us a joy, a joy that is unshakable. Not because there's not things in this world that are scary or fearful or frustrating, because our joy is not placed in those things, it's placed in you. So Father, I pray that you would speak to our hearts today, that you would do what only the Holy Spirit can do. And Father, I ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. So point number one, we see that we are partners in community, and we see this in verses Three through eight partners and community Paul and Timothy servants of Christ Jesus it's important to understand we'll get a little bit of a background I don't want to spend too much time here but we'll give you a little bit of background to the letter that Paul is writing to the church of Philippi or it doesn't make a lot of sense or it's easy to start taking things out of context 
So Paul is under arrest when he's writing this letter. So when every time you read joy, every time you read rejoice, understand that Paul is incarcerated when he is writing this letter. Now, it's possible that he, at the best case scenario, he's under house arrest, but it's also possible that he's in a dungeon, depending on uh, where, when, when uh, Philippians was written, and it's hard to tell sometimes. But he's absolutely under arrest. This is what we call one of his prison epistles, one of his prison letters. So he is writing the, the, the Philippians from jail. And he's writing to the one that's uh, Philippi, uh, to Philippi, which is in uh, Macedonia or uh, modern day Greece. And he's writing to um, a- a- address the issue or the, the, the continuance of joy. Now, many times, if you listen and read the letters of Paul, I had some pictures for Philippi if those are up there. And, uh, and so he went, normally he's writing them uh, because they, are, they have some sort of a huge sin that they are wrestling with or maybe because uh, there's some sort of uh, false teaching has crept in. And, and, and it's a whole different tone if you read how he writes to the Galatians or how he writes to the Corinthians. Uh, they are dealing with very different things. But that's not what's happening here in ancient Philippi. This is a church that is strong, that loves Jesus, and he's encouraging them, hey, just keep on fighting the good fight and continue in the joy that comes in Christ Jesus. He's writing them to, to, to lo- out of love and affection. That Paul has a, a prior relationship with them. Paul had, had several missionary journeys, and on one of these journeys, he, uh, he starts and in, in, in is evangelizing in the, in the area around Greece uh, called uh, Philippi, and that's when he started the church. So, so he began with all of these believers. So he has a great and a nurturing relationship with them. But Paul, full of joy, under very hard circumstances. You know, I've spent a lot of time in jail. Visiting. (laughs) And any time I've been to jail, I've always been thrilled to leave jail. I've never been in there and thought, man, I love what you've done with the place. I love the bars on the windows and the squishy furniture so you can't pick it up and kill each other with it. I love the matching outfits. Hit that laugh track. No, okay. I never thought those things, right? Prison, generally speaking, is a joyless place. It's not a place that has a lot of joy. And yet the Apostle Paul is optimistic even exuberant, filled with joy. And in verse 5, skip down here in verse 5 with me. It says, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. This partnership he had with the Philippian believers, they had supported him in his ministry and prayers and encouragement, and, uh, and, and monetarily they've been supporting him since their church Began And that's when uh, Timothy came along the scene. And, and Timothy, although he didn't likely help write this letter, he's saying, remember Timothy? Remember when he was this intern that was with me and he was sort of wet behind the ears when you first met him? And now he's grown into a, a man of faith and, and he sends you greeting as well. And in verses 3 through 6, we see this joyful prayer. It says, I thank my God in all remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, that for, for you are all making my prayer with joy. So just thinking about you, praying about you has brought me joy. So not just Christ, but Christ's people can bring the believer joy. And he says, I thank God for the, his unwavering plans. One of my favorite Bible verses in all Scripture is verse 6. And he says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work and you will bring it to completion in the day of Jesus Christ, that even though I'm not perfect, even though I'm a rough draft, even though I've got a long ways to go until Christ has wholly made me like him, and it won't happen completely until the other side of heaven, but God is doing a work in me. He's continuing to do a work in me until he's finished that job. And if God started a work in you, friend, he's going to finish the job. That brings me encouragement. Look at verse 7. That it is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart. For you all, you are all, I have a hard time saying you all as a southerner. I would just say y'all. And uh, so he said, y'all are partakers with me of 
grace. Now, this word partakers here is the word that we use for fellowship. It's often translated fellowship, the word koinonia, the word we use for fellowship. Now, if we're not careful, sort of like a worn out penny, uh, the word will start losing its impression. And so when we say the word fellowship, we say things like the fellowship hall. We're going to have a fellowship, and we mean this we're going to be hanging out or shooting the breeze. Now, I'm not saying that, that talking and, and, and having friendship is not part of what fellowship is, but we are selling fellowships, biblical fellowships, very short, if that's, all, if that's the only understanding that we have of fellowship. The word fellowship simply means to have in common. But what do believers have in common? We understand fellowship. We have fellowship of the Spirit, that we're all born again. We're here because we recognize that we could not save ourselves, that we needed Christ Jesus. We could not live a righteous life on our own, and we needed the blood of Jesus Christ to forgive us and save our souls. Amen? Amen? That's why we're here, under the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why, we are, that's why we have fellowship in the Spirit. But that's not all that we have. We have fellowship in His sufferings. We are, we, we are believers, and so Jesus said, you will suffer as a believer. And Jesus Christ suffered, and so we will suffer with Him, and we suffer together. Fellowship means to be sharing with others. We share what we have uh, in the physical sense, in the spiritual sense, in the emotional sense. We share with each other. But in Philippians specifically, fellowship is the gospel-centered friendship and mission of the church. Don't get me wrong. Friendship is crucial to a a real uh, abiding fellowship. And churches are, are not bad at that part. But fellowship is more than just friendship. Fellowship is to be on mission together for Christ Jesus. What is the mission of the church? To know Jesus and to make him known. Will you say that with me, church? To know Jesus and to make him known. To know Jesus and to make him known. That's not complicated, but that is the mission of the church. So friendship, so fellowship is not simply having friends with each other, but we have friendship, we have relationships with each other to further the gospel message in a lost and dying world. That's what our plan, that's our purpose is. Everything in this church should be centered around that mission. When we work together, we're going to have great impact on this world. Now, several months back, maybe during the springtime, something that I hadn't experienced before, not being from Arizona, I walked outside and, and I looked at one of my tree branches and there was this gigantic clump of bees about the size of a basketball. Now, people from Arizona know about this. This is just a swarm of bees, but I'm looking at this thing and going, man, Never seen this before. Uh, this wasn't here yesterday. And now all of a sudden there's just gigantic, what I thought was a hive of bees. And so I call the bee guy, and I'm like, hey, man, I got a problem here. And, uh, and he says, no, man, it's just a swarm of bees. It's not actually a, a, a hive, a, a honeycomb or anything. It's just thousands and thousands of bees stacked on top of each other, and they'll kind of move away and do their own thing. And I said, okay, no problem. And because generally speaking, right, when bees are around, you just got to get a flip-flop, take care of it, and that's the end of that problem, right? <laughs> and I didn't do anything crazy. I know you all are thinking. <laughs> and so when I look at all these bees, and I recognize there are thousands upon thousands of bees all clumped together. And I thought, I better be careful in touching these bees, or they're going to have a great impact on my life. They have a purpose. They have a mission. They're trying to find home. They're nurturing each other. They're helping each other. They're protecting each other. They're on mission. And together, they have a great impact on people. Individually, they don't have a lot of impact. Together, they're a powerful force. As believers, together, in fellowship, on mission together, the church is a powerful force. For good, I'm not sure thousands of bees are a powerful force for good if they were attacking you, but they are a powerful force. But as believers, we are a powerful force when we are working together, helping each other, encouraging each other, nourishing each other, protecting each other. The church together, the church collectively, collectively, the body of Christ can have a powerful impact on this world. 
there are several obstacles to biblical fellowship. Sensationalism is one of them. People always wanting something exciting, and they find church life to just be too dull for them. And they, they're wanting the next exciting thing, the next wild thing. And so church life, that they always want something bigger and better. And if they don't have it, they want to sort of make something, to manufacture something dramatic. Well, that hurts true fellowship. Sometimes relationships are, I would say most times, relationships are just low-key. And it's in the low-key so humble service of your other brothers and sisters in Christ. That's how we minister to each other. That's how we minister to a lost world. There's an obstacle of mysticism. You've been around the people, man. It's just, it's just them and Jesus, man. It's just them and their devotions and, and uh, them and their quiet time. It's just Jesus and me. Well, that's fine and good. You need to have Jesus and me, but the Bible says you need to be part of a Jesus and we. And you come here today, and, and, and I don't ever listen to somebody say, hey, man, it's just, it's just you and Jesus today worshiping. That's baloney. <laughs> you're here to, to encourage brothers and sisters in Christ. Yeah, you're here with Jesus, but you're here with other brothers and sisters in Christ. You're here to build each other up, to strengthen each other, to sharpen each other, to encourage each other. That's your responsibility. That's half the reason why we meet. Yes, we want to honor Jesus Christ and glorify him, but we do that by respecting and loving each other. It's just not Jesus and me not a biblical concept. It's Jesus and we. We live together. This next one, idealism, is a difficult obstacle for a lot of people to get over. They have this ideal picture, understanding of how the church should be, how people should act, how pastors should, should live and dress and talk, how music ministers should sing. And if you don't meet, meet that ideal picture, they get upset. They're out of there. But friend, if you spend any time with believers, you recognize we're not perfect people. People are going to disappoint you. People are going to frustrate you. People are going to make you angry. And that's okay because we're not perfect people. And we don't set people up as perfect people. We worship a perfect Savior. When you have these ideal perspectives, I've seen a lot of people leave a lot of churches because they said, man, a Christian shouldn't act that way. Yeah, they shouldn't, but they're not perfect. And Jesus is. So worship Jesus and not that person and keep on coming to church and help strengthen other people. Lastly, the obstacle of individualism, which is close to some of the other ones we talked about. But hey, I'm just going to live my own life. Uh, even though I'm healthy, even though I've got nothing wrong with me, I'm just going to keep on watching the sermons online. Well, that's an unhealthy individualism we are to serve one another See, the church allows you the joy of looking beyond yourself are you listening to me church church allows you to have joy by looking beyond yourself You've all seen the acronym JOY, J-O-Y, sort of cheesy, right? But Jesus, others, yourself. You want to have joy in your life, Jesus, others, yourself. In church, you get to share the joy of other people. I'm telling you, if you're only joyful when, when things are going well for you, that's not a lot of joy in your life. But I get to come to church, and I get to experience your joy. I get to see your, your victories over sin, your, your, your things you're thankful for, the things that you're, you're celebrating, and I get to celebrate that with you. So then your joy becomes my joy, and then it's just joy. The Apostle Paul was writing, and he said, just praying about you makes me joyful. So when you get to be around other believers, they bring joy to your life. And you share joy in there. So we get to enjoy others, and we get to enjoy their joy. See, our culture says joy must be me-focused. I want attention to me. I want you to think I'm great. I want you to think I'm grand. I want you to hear about my skills and my story. I want you to be impressed with me. And once I run it through the filter of me, then I can maybe be joyful. And the Bible says it's the complete opposite way around. It's not that you're not important. It's not that you're not significant in the eyes of God. But he said, if you want to experience joy, you put Jesus first, you put others first, and then you look to the needs of yourself. And that's when you'll find joy. 
you ever watch those TV commercials or maybe you've been on mission trips where you've seen people that are starving and it's really and it breaks your heart right you see the, their ribs are protruding you see their sunken cheeks sort of lethargic movements and you see all the signs of people that are starving now you'd be hard pressed to find people that are starving in this country although there are some you can find people that are starving in their souls. They're starving for joy. And you see the symptoms are not the same as physical symptoms, but they go around looking for joy. They're on their fifth marriage, and they're looking for joy, hoping the next one will do it. They may have a different hobby every other week because they're looking for a joy that they can't find. They struggle with a substance, and they're looking for joy. They're looking for peace. They're looking for joy, but they're starved for it because they're not going to the only place that brings true and lasting joy. When you join a fellowship, when you're living in community, you get to serve and share and enjoy and live with other believers in that community. Christ's community builds up. It encourages. It challenges. It supports. When you're grieving, people grieve with you. When you need to be held up, they hold you up. When you need to be loved, they love you. That's what a body of Christ is supposed to do. And a body of Christ won't do it perfectly, but a body of Christ that loves Jesus will do it. Truly. You need a body of Christ. You need a community of faith. You find joy by sharing in community with Christ and His people. Let me get to point number two quickly. So we have partners in community, and then we pray for your community. Listen to verses 9 through 11. It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and discernment so that you may abound, so you may approve what is excellent and be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus to the glory and praise of God. Paul prayed specifically for their love to abound, for the Philippian church, for their love to abound and to be filled with the fruit of righteousness. If you're saying, hey, I don't know how to pray for people. I, you know, I pray, pray for sickness all the time, and that's good. We need to be praying for our brothers and sisters that are physically sick. But here are two ways that you can pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ, that they would abound in love and that they would be filled with the fruit of righteousness. Look at verse 9. This is an important verse. Is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and discernment. I heard a wise pastor say that if you picture love, Christian love, as a river, but its banks are knowledge and discernment. Christian love doesn't just flow freely, blind, mere sentimentality. No, it is filled with discernment and Knowledge. Have you ever seen a flooded river and the damage that a flooded river can do? Ruins towns and ruins homes. And a, and a, and a so-called love without knowledge or discernment is no real love at all. And that's the love that our world prescribes all the time. Man, love is blind. No, no love isn't blind. Love is filled with knowledge and discernment. It's guided by it. Not mere emotion, not simply sentimentality. Knowledge in the biblical sense is spiritual biblical truth. It's not talking about just being educated. And discernment is knowing, testing, applying biblical truth to practical living. So, so knowing what the Bible says and then applying it to your life. And you allow those things to guide love in your life. And then it says that you may know what is excellent. See, as we mature as Christians. Our abilities to make right choices should improve as you grow and mature in the Lord. You should be making more and more right choices and less and less wrong choices. When people go to medical school to become a doctor, they get a bachelor's degree, and then they get then they go to medical school, and then they go through residency, and then they have specialties along the way. And if they want more training, they can get and they get more uh, education and they get more knowledge they get more discernment so they get more and more training until uh, they've been at it for a long time but some people have such specific training they just have very uh, minute 
areas of the body that they focus on because they have knowledge and discernment as they mature and grow. And when I have somebody slicing me open, I want them to have all the knowledge and discernment they can possibly have. Amen? Right, you want that too, right? When somebody's putting a pacemaker in, well, I, I hope they know what they're doing. And as they grow and mature that the, and, and their knowledge, their discernment grows. And as believers grow and mature, the, our knowledge and our discernment grows, what God says and how we do it. We need to be able to discern between good things and God things. We need to discern between good things and God things, church, because sometimes those are not the same thing. Not everything you have to discern is between good and evil. Sometimes with a job a promotion can come up and you need to, to move, or maybe this school opens up, or you get a credit card in the mail. Those, aren't, those can be good things. Just because it's a good thing doesn't mean that's what God has for your life. That that's something that you should do. That's somewhere that you should go. That's the person that you should marry. So don't just have good things in your life. You need to have God things in your life. And you do that by having the knowledge and discernment that Scripture provides. In a world that calls evil good, you need to discern what is good and what is evil and do good. Now, I watch the news from time to time. I would encourage you, by and large, to watch the news much less if you want to have joy in your life. And I watch these stories, and I, and I talk with people who don't know Jesus personally, and they don't know good from evil. Now and they, that, that, that line between what is right and what's wrong, which had been built into our culture for a long time, has faded. Many people don't even know what good and evil are anymore. But we don't want to despise those people. We want to hate these people, as Christians can do if they're not careful. We have to make sure that we show them the way, but we've got to know what is good and evil ourselves. Lastly, look at, look at verse 10 with me. It says, so that you may approve what is excellent, and then you're going to, you're going to be pure, and you're going to be blameless for the day of Christ. The word pure here actually means to be tested by sunlight. So when people would sell pottery back in ancient times, what they would do if there was a crack in the pot, which would make it virtually useless, some sort of deceitful people would fill it up with wax, and then they would paint it over. And so it looked like it was good, but it was not good. And so when they would try to sell it to someone, so when they, somebody would sell it, or when a buyer, a, a, a shrewd buyer would bring that pot out and put it in the sunlight. And then you would be able to see if it was worthy of the task it was supposed to do. And God says, when you're using knowledge, love, and discernment, you'll know what is excellent, what is appropriate, what is good and godly and wholesome for your life and for this world. That you can have a genuine, authentic life. And have you heard People say this about Christians all the time, and they're, they're hypocrites, and, and, and uh, most people saying that are hypocrites too, and the answer is yes, we're hypocrites. All people are hypocrites. But through the gospel of Jesus Christ, you can be, live a more authentic Christian life, genuine, people who truly love Jesus, not perfectly, but truly love Jesus. And then the fruit of righteousness is born in our lives. The fruit of righteousness is the outworking of inner righteousness, that Jesus Christ has made us righteousness, righteous in Him, and that righteousness flows through us. Not, it's not us trying to attain righteousness. We are made righteous in Christ Jesus. So pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Pray for your community of faith. In a joyless world, we can celebrate joyfully. We find joy, at least one way, we'll look at many others, in Christ and his community.